you're using right now. And so your body's going to um, try to save some of that energy. What your body's going to do is, is it's going to take ATP and it's going to take creatine. And it's going to take a phosphate. It's going to pop off that third phosphate group and give it to the creatine to form the creatine phosphate. And then let's say you go out for a walk. Now you're going to need energy to power your walk. Now you're going to take that phosphate group from creatine phosphate and attach it to a lesser form of ATP called ADP, which is adenosine diphosphate. Die for two. It only has two phosphate groups on it. And you're going to take that phosphate from creatine and attach it to the ADP to form ATP, which is how you could use the energy. So creatine phosphate is basically a storage container for energy because it's storing a phosphate group. That's how it's giving you energy. And you could use it up. You could use up all your creatine phosphate. And once you use it up, you're no longer getting energy from it. And you use it up quite quickly. It only gives you energy for a couple seconds. So when you jump on a treadmill, the first couple seconds of you on a treadmill feels super easy because you're just using stored energy. You're just using up your creatine phosphate. And that's only for a couple seconds. But we know we could usually do a little bit more exercise than a couple seconds, or at least I hope we can. So for us to power the rest of our workout, well, we're going to need another source of energy. Another source of energy is thanks to anaerobic respiration, sometimes called glycolysis or sometimes called anaerobic glycolysis. All synonyms, anaerobic glycolysis or just glycolysis or anaerobic respiration. This is another source of energy. But this one is now only going to give you um, enough energy for a couple minutes. How? Huh. Let's go through it. It's called anaerobic because it does not require energy. This is a process of, I'm uh, sorry, does not require oxygen. This is a process that makes energy without oxygen. How? You know, the next part of the name gives you a hint. It's called glycolysis. Glycolysis is the process of breaking down sugars for energy. So when you say anaerobic glycolysis, you're basically saying I'm breaking down sugar for energy without oxygen. And that's all this is. That's why when you get a little angry, hangry, what do you reach for? You reach for a Snickers so you could break down all the sugars in the Snickers for energy. <clears throat> that's basically what this is. You're breaking down glucose for energy without oxygen. And because you're not using oxygen, this is not going to be a very efficient way to make energy. So you're not going to make that much. You're only going to make enough for maybe a couple minutes. Kind of imagine trying to work out while holding your breath. It's practically impossible because this is not giving you enough energy. But no worries. There's a yet again another source of energy. This last source of energy is going to give you the most energy. So it's going to give you energy for hours. It's going to give you the longest amount of energy. It's called cellular respiration or sometimes called aerobic respiration. It's still a, a type of respiration where you're breaking down sources of food for energy. In this case, yes, it could be sugars, but not just that. Think major food sources. There are carbs, sugars. There are proteins and amino acids. And there's fats and fatty acids. Remember, we talked about these major organic compounds. You could break them all down for energy. But in order to do that efficiently, you're going to need some oxygen. And because you need oxygen, we call it aerobic. So aerobic respiration is when you break down organic sources of fuel for energy using oxygen. And this is basically what your mitochondria do. This is why your mitochondria are the powerhouses for your organelles. This is why they're the nuclear power plants. This is why they make so much energy because they're doing aerobic respiration or cellular respiration. They're breaking down food sources for energy using oxygen. And this helps to explain your life. This is why whenever you exercise, whenever you hop on that treadmill, first couple seconds, it feels a breeze because you're just burning through all your creatine phosphate. Over the next minute or so, you're still probably doing okay, but it, uh oh, you're probably feeling a little sweat start to form. But then afterwards, you notice you're huffing and puffing. You're breathing hard and fast when you're working out. Why? 
whole point of you huffing and puffing when you're working out is to help provide oxygen to your mitochondria so that they could do aerobic respiration. Why? Because this is going to be the source of energy that's going to give you the most energy to help power your body for the longest amount of time. This is why you breathe harder and faster as you work out longer. You're just trying to keep up with the oxygen demand of aerobic respiration occurring in your mitochondria. So those are your three major sources of energy. But if you've ever worked out, no matter how much energy you might pack into your body, eventually you're going to hit the end to your workout. No matter how much food you eat, you eventually will get tired and not be able to work out. You're going to hit what we call muscle fatigue. Muscle fatigue is literally your muscles inability to, to contract. They cannot contract. Why? Because they don't have enough energy. Just think about it. Maybe they don't, maybe you ran out of your creatine phosphate or there's a point in your workout where no matter how fast you're breathing, you're not going to take in enough oxygen. No matter how hard or fast you breathe at one point in your workout, you're not delivering enough oxygen to your, to your cells and they're not going to be able to generate enough ATP and you're not going to be able to contract so kind of think of running out of energy will cause a muscle fatigue. You've probably seen this when you've watched marathons or commercials of marathon runners. Sometimes you see a marathon runner make it to the finish line and right before they get to the finish line, they collapse. And it's like they try to crawl. You know the person wants to make it to the finish line, but their muscles just won't let them. You're literally watching someone hit a muscle fatigue. They have literally run out of energy. Almost like your car running out of gas. You could run out of gas too. In this case, energy. <clears throat> Why? Because I told you, there's going to be a point in your workout where no matter how hard you breathe, you cannot take in enough oxygen that your body requires. You're going to hit what we call an oxygen debt. An oxygen debt is, is a debt when you owe something. You owe more oxygen than you really um, are getting. And when you owe this oxygen, well, your body's not going to make ATP. It's waiting for the oxygen. You're not going to move. So... This is one major reason why you cannot work out indefinitely. And... Knowing this stuff, remember, we could take advantage of it. This helps to explain stuff, like sporting events. If you've ever watched, for example, a football game, you might notice sometimes on the sidelines, the players have on gas masks. It looks like they have a little oxygen tank with them. It's because they do. It's because they're trying to outpace this oxygen debt. They're just literally inhaling this pure oxygen from this canister to help keep up with the oxygen demands of their cells as they're um, playing the game. So when we know what happens in anatomy, we could take advantage of it to our benefit, like usual. So that helps to explain the basic contractions of a, of a muscle and how do you get the energy to help power it. So the rest of this is kind of switching gears and talking about more of the forces that your muscles, muscles can generate. Now that we know how to contract, now we could talk more about the forces of the contraction. For example, we could talk about how do you control muscle tension. And when we talk about muscle tension, think of, think of it as the strength of a contraction. Meaning I can make a big contraction, generate a large strength, kind of imagine trying to pick up a 300 pound dumbbell. You're going to have to generate a lot of strength or you're going to generate a lot of tension to try to pick it up. Versus trying to pick up a feather. Feathers are practically weightless. So to pick it up, so you have to generate very little tension, very little force. Use very little strength. So we're going to talk about how do you do that? How do you control the tension that you generate? How do you control the force of your muscle contraction? Well, think about the first step in the generation of a muscle contraction period. It starts off with neurons. It starts off with the nervous system. Turns out one neuron could stimulate more than one muscle cell. Let me give the whole thing a name. And you remember, we even named the neuron talking to muscle cells. Remember, the neuron responsible for stimulating muscle cells are motor neurons. So we actually give a name to a motor neuron and all the muscle cells, a.k.a. the muscle fibers, it will innervate, meaning it will stimulate. 
we call this a motor unit. A motor unit is one motor neuron and all the muscle cells it stimulates. And to help control your tension, you just simply control the number of motor units. For example, if I want to pick up, pick up a feather, I don't need my entire muscle strength to do it. I only need to stimulate maybe a, a handful of cells to pick up a, a feather. So I'm really going to use maybe one or two motor units. I'll probably use one or two neurons to talk to a couple of the cells to help me pick up that feather. But if I had to pick up a 300 pound dumbbell, well, I need my entire muscle to work now. And for my entire muscle to work, I need to stimulate all the cells. So I need more neurons to talk to more of the cells. I'm going to need more motor units. So this is how you're contra uh, controlling your contraction strength, your muscle tension. It's just you using fewer motor neurons, fewer neurons than the cells in your muscle, or more of them. That's all that is. <clears throat> and if you're wondering, how is it that we know all this stuff about muscle cells? <coughs> It's because we study them. And it all actually begins very simply. We didn't learn a lot of information just by studying one cell and studying one cell's single contraction. A single muscle contraction of a single cell is what we call a twitch. It's a brief contraction of, of muscle cells. And when you look at a twitch, a brief contraction, you still see all the steps. It has to go through all those steps we talked about in the generation of a muscle contraction. And when you look at all the steps in the generation of a muscle contraction, it could all actually get broken down into three major periods, which is what you see on this chart. They're all highlighted in different colors. There's something called the latent period in blue, the contraction period in red, and the relaxation period in green. Those are the three major periods in a contraction. They're related to the steps. The latent period is when the muscle cell has not yet gotten the signal, where there's movement that's about to occur, but the muscle cell doesn't know it yet. How? Well, think about your first steps. This is like when the action potential is arriving at the axon terminal. The muscle cell doesn't know that. That's happening in the neuron. When you're opening voltage-gated calcium channels and allowing calcium to rush in. The muscle cell doesn't know that. That's happening in the, in the neuron. When acetylcholine is getting released from the axon terminal. The muscle cell doesn't know that yet. This is all happening in the latent period. So you're not going to see a contraction because the muscle cell doesn't know yet. It's waiting to receive the signal. But once it gets the signal, well, it's going to go through the steps of a contraction. That's what you see in red. And then once it's done contracting, well, it needs to relax. That's in green. Oh, and if you notice, oh, it spends a large time relaxing. Almost half the time you see in the chart is spent relaxing. Why? Because it takes time. You got to think about the things you have to do to relax. It takes time to destroy all of the acetylcholine that was released from the axon terminal. It's going to take time to gather up all that calcium and put it back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So believe it or not, your muscle cells spend a large time relaxing. Kind of going back and resetting to get ready for another muscle contraction. Remember, like always, stick to the exam review. What else? We talked about how do you control the force. Not only can you control the force, you could control how long you hold the contraction. Meaning I could hold a contraction. I could, I could pick up a weight and hold it for a period of time and then decide to put it down. When you hold a contraction, a sustained contraction, is a, when you hold a contraction, we call that a tetanus. A tetanus in anatomy is when you have a sustained muscle contraction. <clears throat> so how do you do that? How do you generate a tetanus? How do you hold a contraction? Well, again, it has to deal with the neuron. We, you see from this, this chart here, it's called a myogram. It's just showing in red the force of your contraction. The higher up the line goes means the stronger the force. And the flat plateau you see of the red line way over to the right is, is someone holding a contraction. It's a tetanus. <clears throat> How do you do that? How do you hold a contraction? Well, it has to deal with the second line on the chart. In blue, down below, blue is representing all the action potentials that are being fired off from your neurons. 
and you notice as you read it from left to right, a single action potential could cause a slight twitch, a single generation of a force. And then that muscle cell will go back to relax. But if you notice, if you were to fire off an action potential and then immediately fire another one, the muscle cell 